Hi, I'm Deej. Uh, I'm here to talk about Shen. Um, so Shen is, it's a list, but it's a very different kind of list than what you might be used to. Uh, all arguments are pattern matched, as in you don't pass in the arguments as an S, S expression, you pass in just this pattern that gets matched. It really looks like an ML, but it's a list underneath. Uh, it's got optional types, which means you can turn off type checking, but the type system itself is the most flexible type system that I have personally ever seen. Uh, especially compared to like black box type systems that you get you know, from ML derived languages. Uh, you can really do a lot for yourself, um, especially with type level debugging and stuff like this. And it's also got a built-in grammar parser. And it's got a built-in grammar parser because the author wrote it to parse Shen code itself. So basically, there's no Shen standard library. Everything I'm showing you here are functions available from the compiler itself that are used by the compiler to compile itself. Um, so this is, I mean, this is why it's less, you know, because you can do that kind of stuff. <laughs> so the format of this talk is going to be, um, it's not going to be, here's an introduction to Shen, here's all of the syntax that you need to know to understand Shen. It's going to be more of like, here's some stuff that you can do with Shen that would be difficult, if not impossible, to do with other languages. And hopefully this is more of like a motivating talk, where at the end you're like, maybe I should look into this a little further for some things. So... The first example I'm going to talk about is I'm going to feature uh, that built-in grammar parser that Shen has, and I'm going to do so in the context of functional updates on a JSON structure. Uh, so this is going to deviate a little bit and also talk about lenses. I actually hadn't meant to do that, but I needed that to update you know, a, 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 a deeply nested JSON structure. So here's what we're going to get at the end. We're going to have some function called from JSON, and it's going to take this weird grammar, right? It's, it's either get or set, and some key, and some array index. So what that's saying is drill down into a key, and then drill down to the zeroth element of that array, and either just get it, or add one to it. Um, so reading the JSON from a string, I just use Shen's own reader. Okay? It's good enough to tokenize most of it. So the, um, the left curly brace, that's actually a symbol. Shen sees that as a symbol. The string gets parsed as a string, but unfortunately, once you get to the list, it doesn't quite know what to do with all those commas and ones and all of this stuff. So it says, it's a list, you probably want a cons list back. So it gives you back a cons list where it thinks that one is like a symbol. Like, it's, you see it says cons one over there. So all that stuff needs to be cleaned up before we can do anything with this. But at the end of the day, what we're gonna get is we're gonna get a list with object at the head and a list of pairs that represent key values. Uh, there's only one pair here. So to do that, we're going to use this grammar called uncons. It just basically means take away the consonants. So grammars go into this form called defcc. And the reason it's called defcc is because it stands for define compiler compiler. The reason it's, the reason it's not called a parser uh, will become clear in a couple of slides. But just for now, go with it. Um, so it has three rules. The first rule says, if I see a list with cons at the head and two other elements, then go ahead and eval that cons, right? So if you evaluate a cons list, Shen is just gonna go, okay, cons one, cons two, cons three, there's just one, two, three. Evaluate that, then continue parsing. The second rule here says, if I see anything else, go ahead and stick it into the list, continue parsing. The last rule says, if I get to the end, then just stick that whole thing into the list, concatenate everything, and now I have something I can work with without the cons. What if I want to keep all that is called cons in my, my list? I don't know. <laughs> By the way, um, there's a fair amount to get through, so I'll take questions at the end. Um, sorry. So in order to actually uh, parse the JSON itself, I have a couple of different, a couple of other grammar rules. I have this object grammar. I have this members grammar. I have this pairs grammar. Object just goes, OK, if I see a curly brace and some members and a closed curly brace, it's object with those members inside the list. If I just see uh, open and close curly brace, it's just an empty object. And the same with uh, open curly brace, space close curly brace. I do the cheesy thing uh, because uh, the Shen uh, reader sees open and close without a space in the middle as a single symbol. Uh, so that's why I have to have two different like, things for that. Uh, members is just a pair followed by the symbol comma, followed by more members. A pair is just a string followed by the symbol colon followed by a value, right? And that gets marshaled into a pair 
where the string is now interned into a symbol and the value. And the array is just elements and, you know, and square brackets and what have you. So really, just it's not that hard to understand. And notice how much it looks like the JSON notation directly from JSON.org. This is how JSON.org tells you to parse JSON. And it's almost a mechanical trans translation to that, except for a couple of you know, curly brace stupid little things over there. So that's kind of nice to have. Now we deviate into lenses. So there's a lot of documentation online about lenses, and most of it is really scary. <laughs> and I think that it, all of it, actually everything that I've seen so far, obscures the fact, in my opinion, that a lens is really nothing but a pair of two functions, a getter and a setter. That's it. And a getter and a setter is exactly what you would think a getter and setter are. A getter says, get me something out of the structure. A setter says, put something in that structure. That's it. That's all lenses. But it's very basic, a getter and a setter. So an object lens is a function that takes a key, pattern matches on object at the head of the list, and the key value pairs. And the get key is a function I haven't shown you. All it does is iterate through the key value pairs, find that key, and then return that value. Set key takes those key value pairs and sets um, the key to that value. Notice that set key is queried. All the functions in Shen are queried by default. So if you were to expand set key out, it would, that would actually be lambda, object, some value, set key, key of those pairs and that object to that value. So a lens into uh, an object is just object lens and a key. That's all it is. Arrays are even easier. A getter for an array is just get index, get that index from that array. The setter is just set that index in that array to some value, which will be carried out. Um, a lens to the third element is just array lens two. That's it. That's all there is to it. Composing two lenses is a little bit trickier, but not that much trickier. So what this is saying is if I, have, if I have a lens, lens one and lens two, compose the getter of lens one with the getter of lens two, and then compose the setter of lens two with the, with the setter of lens one. So it's exactly opposite. Uh, the getter goes lens one, lens two, the setter goes lens two, lens one. And then the getters get composed and it, got, it all gets handed back to the setter. And that's how you compose two lenses. So now that I can compose two lenses, I can compose n lenses, right? So now we have a starter lens. Uh, the starter lens just returns itself as the getter, and the setter just sets it to the value that it's given. Uh, does nothing with it. So default over lenses, all I do is compose some lens over the starter lens, and full lens helper, all it does is just keep smushing more lenses onto that. That's all it does. So uh, it's, just a, it's just, I guess, uh, a fold, like catamorphism, what have you. So now that we can smush together a bunch of lenses, we can either modify the thing that the lens is looking at, or we can get at the thing the lens is looking at. Modifying the thing is basically running, getting the thing out of the lens using the getter, running it through some transformation function G, and then handing that to the setter. Right? So we're getting a thing, and then we're setting it. Access is just getting that first, the first of that pair, which is the getter. That's all it is. So, if I want to, if I want to change that one to a two, bump that one up, I fold over an object lens on the A key, an array lens on the zero element, and hang it up and modify with the transformation function plus one. That's it. More involved example, if I want to get at that element four, I would compose an object lens to a key with an array lens to, um, to the third element to an object lens of another key to the array lens of the second element. Compose all of those lenses together, hand it off to modify, a plus one will give you a five. But the UI is messy. I don't really care about writing fold lenses, modify, object lens, array lens, all of this stuff, this is all fluff. Uh, this is all like syntactic gook as far as I'm concerned. All I really care about is a key, two, another key, and one. Because really, if it's a symbol, that means it must be object, uh, it must be a key. If it's a number, it's an array index. So why do I have to specify all this stuff? 
So I want to somehow take that list, set a key to another key one, and decompile it into this. Okay? And here we see a grammar to do that. This is why it's called a compiler compiler, by the way. Because um, it doesn't just take a string and like marshal it into some internal value. It can generate computation as it goes. So the first grammar action pattern matches on either a get or a set. If it's a set, it sticks the function modify at the head, and it folds over the rest of the lenses. If it's a get, it sticks the function access and then folds over the rest folds over the rest of the lenses. The lens is just a uh, the lens is just a grammar where if it's a number, it's an array lens. If it's a symbol, it's an object lens. So that list decompiles exactly to that computation. So putting it all together, we have a function from JSON. We read the JSON string uh, through the reader, clean up the cons with uncons, and then pass it into object where it's converted into that um, internal representation that we like. And take the path, pass it into the grammar action, compile it with the grammar action, so we now have that function. And that's really all there is to it. So, if I want to change five to a six over there, I just go from JSON, uh, that action, which is set a key to another key to, uh, the JSON string, and the um, whatever transformation function we want, and we get back um, the final result with the five bump to a six. Uh, are, are your data and center are pure, or are they imperative here? Uh, they're pure. Pure. Yeah. So the original structure isn't changed. Uh, this is a functional update. Okay. So that was that. That's the first example. Uh, the second example I want to talk through is uh, we're going to take just sort of an initial look at the type system. And we're going to talk about debugging at the type level. So um, here the example is inserting coins into a coin store. So I have this function called insert coin. It takes a penny. It gives me a list with a penny inside of it. And the type is list coin. It takes a dime. It gives me back now a list with a penny and a dime. And the type is list coin. So a data type in Shen is, goes into this data type form. And it's broken up by what are called sequence. And a sequence is nothing more than a bar with the thing that you want to prove under the bar and all of the things that have to be true in order for the thing under the bar to be true above the bar, right? So things that you need to prove that need to be true above the bar, things that you want to prove below the bar. So this is a data type that corresponds roughly to like an ML sum type, okay? So here I have a penny, and I'm saying it's a coin, but there's nothing above the bar. I don't have to prove anything in order to show that a penny is a coin. It's just a coin, like I'm just declaring it. Um, and the same with a nickel, a dime, and a quarter. I have a store, which is a global immutable variable, yes, uh, that, that is of type list coin. I'm telling the type system about that. But then the other two sequences are a little more interesting. They're saying that, so value is a function that gets something out of a variable. I'm saying value x is of type A if x is of type A, right? And setter is a, a setting a variable is the same thing. I'm saying I set x to a y, and that form is going to be of type A if y is of type A, right? And here's the insert point function. Uh, it appends point to the value of the store, and that's a list of coins. Setting the store is also a list of coins, so this all type trace. So I'm going to initialize the store to an empty list. I'm going to try and insert a penny, and I get a type error. By the way, that is the type error. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that's it. You could have a million line function, and that's all it would return. There is no fancy on this line, on this column, you should have said this, or I found this. So, so, this, so someone looked at prologue and was like, we need those error messages? <laughs> you know why? Because the type checker is a prologue. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so this seems like a huge step backwards. <laughs> All right. But it, but it really isn't, because Shen provides this thing called spy plus. And what spy plus says is, anytime you make an inference type checker, show me where you are, and let me step through it. 
Okay, so I go slide plus and I try and insert a penny again, and it stops right there. It says, okay, I'm now trying to understand what the type of defined blah blah is. I'm going to gensum up a variable, if that's what I think it is. The coin that you're passing in is a type coin. So I'm going to make myself a fresh type variable here and try and unify that type variable with coin. Insert coin you've already told me is coin going to list of coin. So now I have parameters under which I can solve this constraint. So it's going to keep iterating, it's going to keep like looking at each of the expressions in turn. It's going to get to append, right? And it's going to say append, appending to a coin, I know is a list of coin because I know what the type signature of append is. And a coin is now a coin. Insert coin is still going is still coin going to list of coin. And now it gets to coin. It says, given what I know about a pen, coin must be a list of coins. But coin is a coin. I can't <coughs> unify those two. Type error. So it took away your ability to see a, you know, expect that this found this, but it gave you the ability to step through the type checker at a very, very granular level. And this makes a, a lot of difference on like non-trivial examples like this, especially when you're playing around with your own typing rules, which I'll show you in a second. So of course the fix is to put coin in the list. That's the fix. But above the bar, you can also have these things called side conditions. Side conditions go uh, inside that little if block looking thing, and it's just a thing that needs to be true in order for the thing below the bar to be proven. So you can put arbitrary, arbitrary things in there, including debug statements. Yes. Yeah, so you can put a debug statement in there. Yeah, and every time the type checker hits that rule, it's going to spit out dirt on the penny. So I go insert coin, the type checker spits that out. Yeah. Is it going to do that when it's just attempting to run that rule before it backtracks through the inference tree? Uh, no, it does it every time you hit that rule. So, so yeah, so even even if it's a, a branch of the tree that's going oh, yeah. to actually turn off. Yeah. Okay. But we but but the type checker has a cut. I can put that in there. So, but oh, okay. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so I can now do ad hoc whole driven development. Remember, <laughs> <laughs> I know not. Oh, for those of you who uh, uh, don't know Haskell, a whole is when you have like an expression in like Haskell code, you can just replace it with an underscore, and when the type checker comes through there, it'll see that underscore and go, oh, this underscore is supposed to be of type XYZ. So it's sort of like a workflow where if you don't know what the type of something's going to be, you just stick a hole in there and have, the, and have the type checker tell you what it's supposed to be. So here we have a hole. So a hole is just the symbol like angle bracket, angle bracket, hole, and it type checks to anything. Right? That's what that capital X means. It means whatever hole is, it works. Okay? And now I have a side condition that says, what do you think hole is? Print that out right now. All right. So if I have insert point and I don't know what goes after set store, I can just put that hole symbol in there. And when the type checker gets around to that, it'll just print that hole as a list of point. Because that's what it is at that particular moment in time. Or that's what the type checker wants it to do. By the way, don't run this without type checking or it'll actually stick a hole inside of your coin store. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a symbol. <laughs> All right, okay. So, that was that example. So here's another one. We can use the type checker to do runtime reflection. There's almost nothing you have to do to make that happen. So we can grow a data type at runtime. This comes with disadvantages, which we're probably all aware of right now. But <laughs> <laughs> so I have this function called with store that could probably be better named. With store penny means stick a penny in my store. Uh, and it's going to say, so what we're going to do is we have this function with store. The type environment has no notion of pennies or quarters or nickels or dimes at this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to teach it about pennies and quarters and nickels and dimes on the fly at runtime. So with store penny is going to say penny is not a coin. So I'm going to teach it by saying make me a penny. And it's going to return me like some type, type coin. And now I'm going to stick a penny. It knows what it is now. I'm going to remove the penny. And now it's forgotten what a penny is. So, OK. So here we go. How, do, how does this happen? This happens because the shen type check function is available to you. Like you can pass whatever you want in there. right? So I'm saying give me a coin. Call type check on that coin, and if it's of type coin, then do whatever you need to do. If it's not of type coin, 
then spit out a string that says this is not a type point. So shen.typecheck uh, hello world string returns me a string. Shen.typecheck hello world number returns me false. By the way, yes, string versus false because prologue. <laughs> <laughs> so, in order to teach uh, the runtime about pennies and nickels and dimes and what have you, I have this function called twocoin that just takes a coin type and sticks it into a global list of coin types, like nickels, pennies, dimes, what have you, or removes it. Now, I can create a fresh data type using the list of coin types, and then I eval that data type at runtime. So now it's part of the runtime environment. How do I create a data type? Bunch of people shaking their heads, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this function called create data type. It takes a bunch of coins. All it does is draw that data type using like the AST. So I have a data type, and for each point, it's actually sticking that bar in there and going coin as a type point. Right? So I can go create data type, penny dime, it's actually outputting this like AST, which I evaluate, and now this is part of the environment. One second. And the thing is, I also store it in this global variable. So at runtime, you can see the running whatever data type it is. Now, can you file this out? And later on, as you know, when you want to stop the environment and like actually Hard, harden up some of the types, file that back in. Sure, you can do that. Uh, have I given you a way of doing type level injection <laughs> in addition to SQL injection? Yes, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you sleep at night? <laughs> But, I mean, think about it, okay, all right, so you don't have to like have this going on every part of your type system. If you expose your entire type system to the user, what, what are you doing like in this business, you know? Like, <laughs> exposing a small part of that type checker, a small amount of, a small number of your types before you decide to harden down and say, I'm committing to these types in perpetuity. And by in perpetuity, I mean between the time the program starts and stops and you have to restart again. So like things like, I don't know, like fields, like these fields that can take on any value in like a web form or something like that. We tend to want to encode those as some types, but we don't know what all those some types are going to be. So why not let the user have a little leeway on telling us what those things are over time? Of course, use caution, but uh, it's, it's kind of nice that it's there. Okay, that was that example. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about using the functions inside of your compiler to inspect your own source code and dump out type information. And you get like a DIY Hoogle out of this. And Hoogle, for those of you who don't know what that is, is Haskell has like a type signature search engine. So if you go to like haskell.org slash Hoogle and you go like A going to Google or something, it'll like spit out all the functions that it knows about where it takes some kind of A and returns some Boolean value. So we're gonna do that for ourselves here. So notice I said that uh, so before I said shen type check took something and a type, well, it doesn't actually need to take a type. It can take a wildcard, like capital A, which gets unified to the type. Remember, it's a prologue. Wildcard variables just appear out of nowhere. <laughs> okay, so shen type check 1A spits out a number. So now I don't have to know the type ahead of time. I can give it a thing and say, what is the type of this thing? Okay. So. I'm gonna create me up an undefined type, uh, because I can. So I'm mixing two idioms here. Undefined from Haskell means this type stands in for anything. Question mark, question mark, question mark is a thing they use in Scala. It also means stand in for everything. And I kinda like question mark better, so I'm gonna use that. And I'm gonna gen up some functions. So here I have a function going from A to B to C, uh, B to C to B, C to D, and A to e, e, right? So what I'm gonna do is grab all the type signatures from those functions. But I'm not just going to parse the function and do something cheesy like look for like an open curly brace and a closed curly brace and all this stuff uh, because I can already do that. What I want to do is I want to type check that file and then ask the Shen environment, get me the, what you think the signature of those functions are right now. Right? So I wrote this function called dump that takes a file name and it spits out the names of all of the functions 
with their type signatures. And you know that it's not simply parsing it out because it's returning it in, in that weird, like, curried form that Shen likes to store things in. Uh, don't worry about why. So can you roll your own semantic versioning now? Do you even need semantic versioning at this point? Because now you, now you can compare, like, the tips of two branches on your Git repo. You don't need to have, like, okay, at this point, you know, we do a release, and now we have some specialized function that compares this release against that release. I just did it in, like, 10 lines of code. So this is dump. So dump takes a path, it reads that file, and by reading that file, I mean it splits out all of the S expressions. Uh, so there's like a list of S expressions now. And now I pattern match on that S expression, and if it starts with a define, I just pull out the name of the function. And then I pull out the name of the function and pass it to this function called get sig, which basically all it does is delegate to type check. Oh, and by the way, I have to do the cheesy protect A thing over there uh, because uh, Shen functions don't like it when wildcards just appear uh, on the right-hand side of the arrow. Uh, Prolog's totally fine with that, but Shen functions will say there's a free variable over there, you need to do something about that. Protect, tell, protect, tell, protect tells Shen, don't worry about it, I got it. So, now I have, so that's how you get uh, a, a listing of APIs. Right? Now I can even do a Google style search. Right? So I've written this function called find signature that says in that list of functions that I've given you, find me any signature that's A to B to whatever. A to B to C, A to B to D, E, whatever. And it's going to spit out A, B, C. Because that's the only one there is. So, find signature. <laughs> it's doing a bunch of stuff, but what it's, the primary thing that it's doing is it's jamming up a grammar at runtime with some weird name, like it doesn't matter, like some Jensen name. And it's taking that signature and saying, parse this grammar on everything that comes in, all the signatures that come in. And then eval it at runtime. Okay, so the generated grammar for A to B to X looks something like that. Okay, that's that. Where am I? Left some time. So now for my final trick. Um, well, it's not my trick. Uh, the guy who wrote uh, Shen came up with this. Uh, so I was going to show you HList, but I decided to show you this instead because this is way more fun. Uh, so this is emulating rank n types in Shen. So in Haskell, you have this for all thing, which you know. Would, which you can like scope over some types and you get existential quantification. In Shen, you don't have that, right? So uh, this function a to a with a number, x symbol, will fail to type check because the type variable a needs to be instantiated depending upon what it's being applied to, right? So now what we're gonna do is talk through this nice little hack that uh, the Shen author wrote and basically introduces this for all symbol so for all a, a going to a, number x symbol, and now you can apply f to one and f to a, and this type check, type checks, and it works. So the way it does this, uh, yeah, it's called Frankenstein. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so the way it does that is, the first thing it does is it says, for all a, so if, okay, so the first thing it does it, 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 is it turns off unification. That's what mode minus does. Uh, and it says, in order to prove that x is for all a going to be, I have to substitute all instances of a inside of b with some Jensen variable. And that is now the type of x. <laughs> so c would be something like, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 going to 1, 2, 1, 2 3, 4, 5 instead of a going to a. So, when you're type checking f1, what you want to do is convert for all a, a going to a, into some free variable going to another free variable. Because now, the type system can unify the free variable to whatever is given to it. Yes? So this is basically encoding uh, you know, rank two universal types through skullizing to a set null existential. Yes. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So if there was a B, B is not in scope. I mean, B is somewhere in universal scope. It's not in like local scope. So it's just free variable going to B, right? So how is this accomplished? Well, 
Something I didn't tell you about the Shen data types, uh, the Shen type system, is you have complete uh, control, not just over the types themselves, but over the environment in which the type checker is currently right now. Okay, so that's what this is saying. So notice the um, greater than, greater than P. Anything to the left of greater than, greater than is the current type environment. So what this is saying is that in order to prove something, P, it doesn't matter what it is, if there is a for all, A, B, in the environment, then run this basically type level function scheme that generates the substitution S, and in place, substitute X as type S inside of our current environment on the fly in the given context right now. Make sense? Probably not. But. <laughs> <laughs> so the way it does this is, oh, by the way, there's your cut right there that limits backtracking that just gets spliced into like a def prolog clause. But in any case, um, so what this is doing is it's recursing, so scheme takes A, the body B, some outputted substitute, and some fresh type variable V. And it substitutes, any time it sees A and B, it substitutes B. <coughs> so what we're doing is recursing at the type level using scheme. And what this is saying, scheme is not the language, scheme is what this is, <laughs> what this is called. Um, so this is saying, okay, pattern match on the head of B, and B in this case is A dash dash arrow A, right? So B in the first case is just going to be A, in the second case is going to be dash dash arrow, and the third case is just going to be A. Okay, and build up this list, D, E. All right, that's the first one. The second one says, if you get to a point where A is found in B, then just substitute that with V. Okay, so that, that, that Explanation, exclamation point means once you get to this rule, commit to this rule. You can't backtrack beyond this. And in the end, if you see a scheme with an A and a B, and B is exactly the same, just return it, we're done. So we're recursive. Now, this is not clear from the data type definition, but this might make it a little clearer. This is something prologish looking. So this is saying, given a goal, right? Pattern matched over B over C, uh, pattern matched with the head B and the rest of the list C, make me up that substitution using these rules. And in the end, this is not too far from what all of this gets decompiled to. So now, anytime it sees a for all, it's going to substitute anything that all of the lambda variables, basically, that are given to that expression with some fresh type variable that can be unified over anything that's passed to it. That makes any sense. So that's pretty much what I had. Um, I wanted to speed things along so uh, people had a chance to, like we wouldn't be too far back uh, with the other speakers. Uh, but I'll take any questions if you have them. Yeah. So it seems like you have this sequence calculus in your type system, right? And sequence calculi are often used for defining type systems. And so it seems like, you know, if, if the sequence calculus you have is flexible enough, in principle you could, for example, like define the type system of Agda like, as types in this language. Do you have any idea whether that kind of thing would be possible? Oh, it's possible and it's supported. Uh, because, so what you can do is, you can define type system as a set of type rules, right? But uh, Shen, which I haven't shown you, also lets you preclude and include type rules into whatever, into whatever package you are in right now. So for example, uh, say you had like some kind of type class rule, like you, you invent type classes and stick them into Shen, right? Okay, so obviously type classes are going to fail if you have type checking turned off because you need, you need the type system to tell you what to dispatch to, right? So you can just not include that rule inside of whatever package you're working in if you don't need type classes, right? So um, it's, it's very, very flexible that way, yeah. So basically, you're, you can roll your own type system and, and export it as a library. Yeah? Something that occurs to me is that um, this is like a, a more refined, both well, syntactically and runtime-wise, version of um, 
the Scala trick for programming the type system. Because in Scala, we have a prologue at the type level, which is the implicit search space. Mm -hmm. And you know, because we have functional dependencies, we can unify variables to that. So you right. do just like write your own type system, and that's, that's how you program it. Sure. Um, this, is, this is doing the exact same thing, still with the rules, except it's just like everything is much more first class. Yeah, time. yeah. And I, I think that this would, be an, this would be an intractable approach, in my opinion, if it wasn't for the type level debugging tools available to you. Because all the stuff that I came up with, I did not just come up with that on the fly. It took, it, it took a lot of me trying to figure out why this rule isn't firing as it is and all of this stuff. Uh, by the way, um, Shen does not support dependent types. Uh, so some of you are saying, you know, let's stick Agda in here. It's not going to work. Uh, because um, the, the, at least the Shen type checker, as it stands right now, doesn't have the logical capability of, of being able to understand dependent types as it stands. Would you be able to unify a type variable with a symbol and then kind of walk through that? Possibly. I've tried it. I've come up with something dependent typish looking. So I've, I've, I've made hless, but I can't do a whole lot with the hless once I've made it. Uh, because abstracting over that is something that the Shen type checker doesn't know how to do right now. That, that's not to say that you can't override Shen.typeCheck with, with, <laughs> with your own type checker and just kind of surprise your users that way. But, <laughs> yes? Something I want to do with the type checker typically is uh, separate comp compilation where I rem rem remember the type of one module and I when I look at another module, I only need to look at the types of the other module and not uh, don't need to retype everything I use every time I use it. Uh, can you do you have any notion of modules in Shen that would work well with the type checker? Or? Uh, Shen does not have modules. Okay. You can make your own, but it does not have modules. It, it's all DIY at this point. All right. It's it's a very Spartan language. Yes. Oh, so I guess like, um, are you able to identify like sort of the logical limitation in Chen's type system that prevents you from defining dependent type systems in it? The short answer is the author has an answer for that, but I don't because I don't understand logic systems well enough to be able to answer that. But uh, he, he does say that it won't support dependent type systems as written, which isn't to say. He also says, go ahead and overwrite it if you want to. But I, don't, I, don't, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I'm not, I'm not an expert on logic systems. Thanks. I'm not sure I believe it. Huh? I'm not sure I believe it. It really, really, like everything you've shown, really, really looks like you have the capacity to do it. It's it just, did you talk about type check, Shen dot type check as written, right? Yeah. That, that one function. Uh, actually, uh, the, the type check function is actually a, a, a prologue function called T star, but type check delegates to that, and you would have to um, override T star. So with you both might be right. Like, you say you don't believe it, but he's saying override this yeah, I function. Mean, yeah. I don't know. It seems, it seems like a fun space to play, like you did with HLS. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you.